Hey. Hi, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. We all want to create a safe and nurturing environment for our fairy companions, but accidents and emergencies do happen. So today I wanted to talk to you a little bit about first aid, some things that you should be prepared with, um, things to have in a first aid kit, things that information that you need to know, also things that you should be aware of and things to keep an eye out for. So the first thing I wanted to talk to you about was creating a basic pet first aid kit, the things that you might just need to have around in case something goes wrong. So the first thing to have would be the essentials, so bandages for support to stop bleeding, some sterile gauze swabs so they can be handy if you've got an open wound to protect it or if there's an eye injury or something like that. A bit of tape for sticking things on, uh, some antiseptic solution. The best antiseptic solutions would be to have a dilute chlorhexidine or a betadine solution. The other thing is sometimes if you can, a thermometer, uh, you do need to make sure that it is a thermometer that is a rectal thermometer. You can't use the digital ones for the forehead or the ears in pets. They're just not effective. And if you're gonna be using a thermometer rectally, then you also need to make sure you've got a little bit of uh, lubricant. You can get small sterile packets of lubricant or just a tube from the supermarket will be fine. Um, there's just nothing worse than sticking a thermometer up a dry butt. Uh, the other thing that would be important is have a list of important phone numbers. So if you're local, have a, your vet's phone number and the closest 24-hour practice. So they're at hand and ready to go just in case you need them at short notice. If you're traveling and you're traveling and going to a particular spot, just being aware of where the vets are and you know, is there an after hour service? Is there a 24 hour service? And what are their phone numbers as you're moving into those areas um, if you're traveling with your pets? Keep all that stuff assembled and keep it somewhere that's close by and that everyone knows where it is. So if someone needs to access it and you're not there, that people know um, how, how to get it and, and what's in it. Another thing that can be super handy is an old towel or blanket. So that can be useful for transporting a pet that's injured or wrapping them if they become, if they get a bit uh, shocky, uh, keep it, keeping them warm. If you've got a dog that is injured and painful, it may also try and bite or be aggressive. So a towel as a gentle wrap over the head or around the muzzle can also be really um, useful to give a bit of protection to yourself, but also to the pet. As well as having that first aid kit uh, assembled and, and knowing all those numbers, we should be aware of what are things that we may have around in our house normally that are potential pet hazards. So the main things that I think we need to be aware of are some indoor plants. So there are certainly some plants that are quite toxic to our pets. Um, things like your lilies, so many ornamental lilies and uh, lilies that you can buy for flower arrangements. The pollen and even the flowers, all parts of those can be quite toxic. They can cause kidney failure in cats. So that's certainly something to be aware of. Other plants like azaleas, sago palms, etc., can be very, very dangerous um, in ranging from things like gastrointestinal upsets to liver and kidney failure. Um, so being aware of the plants that you've got in the house and are they safe to have with your pets is important. The other thing is food. So some of our food items and the things that we eat are fine for us and not so good for your pets. There are a few really common things that we know. Um, artificial sweetener, the artificial sweetener xylitol uh, can be very toxic uh, and certainly something that if your pet has access to that, you'd want immediate veterinary attention. Chocolate uh, and particularly your dark and cooking chocolates uh, are also very toxic. Then you have grapes and sultanas, uh, you know, your dry varieties of your grapes, so your sultanas, currants and raisins uh, are, can be particularly toxic to some dogs. So that's one thing to be aware of. Other food items that might seem innocuous, but uh, can, can be to toxic to pets are 
things like avocado can cause a bit of an upset and then just also being aware of cooked bones so i am a advocate for dogs eating fresh raw bones under certain conditions but cooked bones can certainly cause intestinal blockages and can you can get shattered teeth or, or um, cracked teeth from dogs chewing on those cooked bones because they don't break down they're very very hard and they the dogs just don't digest them very effectively if it's an old bone that's been hanging around in the yard for too long it can also have some bacterial contamination which can cause uh, an upset as well certain um, other household things that might cause some problems are some of the essential oils so oil diffusers and, and burners uh, can be quite toxic if they get on your pet's fur and particularly cats if they then try and lick those oils off they can be quite corrosive in their mouths in the garage we've got things like um, antifreeze and then there are solvents and paint thinners uh, making sure things like that are all kept out of reach that they're labeled and, and that we know what is dangerous and that pets can't have access to it lids are on tight things can't be knocked over or if they're in glass bottles they can't be pushed over and have that glass shatter not only having the glass cause a, a potential hazard but the um the whatever is in those containers can also be be quite dangerous particularly in the garage i've also had um, things like snail bait that people thought were in uh, childproof or pet proof containers and dogs have managed to find their way into that these these things are designed to be attractive for rodents uh, and snails um so so rats and mice are attracted to rat sacks and dogs can also be attracted to the things in them as well so and the same for snail baits so we just need to make sure that these things are stored very very safely and out of reach of pets a couple of other things i'd like to talk about is you know what happens if your pet does get a wound so if you've got a bleeding pet or they've got an injury so the most important thing is if you've got an actively bleeding wound you want to try and stop it as quickly and as effectively as possible the best way to do that is to apply so if a small wound gauze swab and wrap it up seek veterinary attention or if it's you know if you've got a big bleeding wound just pack it with as much pressure so that's where this old towel can come come in handy as well pack it down apply pressure and that in itself will actually help to stem a lot of bleeding just don't let it continue to bleed out without have, having some um, attention eye injuries are something that is uh, another problem that we do see so we see this thing called a big dog little dog accident and when you've got certain breeds like your um your short nosed breeds that have large eye sockets like your pugs and your peganese uh, they can have issues where they actually pop their eyeballs out as horrible as it sounds um and that's going to be a much higher risk if there's something like if a big dog grabs it and shakes it then it's very easy for those eyeballs to pop out sometimes first thing you want to do is keep that eye moist so eye injuries eyes drying out can you know lead to killing an eye that might otherwise be savable so wet moisture water saline is important and then just applying some gentle pressure until you can get and see a veterinarian who you know popped out eyes don't necessarily mean a blind eye uh, but you know it is something that you want to have attention to straight away if you're going to give your pet any chance of having any, any improvement or saving saving that eye if you have a fracture so depending on where that fracture is if your dog happens to have an injury or fall and you notice particularly below the elbow or the knee if you're seeing the limb is hanging and loose and it's on a bit of a weird angle then you want to try and support that limb as best you can so splinting um, bandaging can be helpful just something that's going to stop movement because movement of a fracture is very painful uh, but you can also start to dislodge the blood vessels and and do more damage and displace that fracture a lot more which can make it a lot worse so using um, anything to splint either side of that, that fracture site and popping a bandage along it 
Be careful not to do it too tight because you don't want to occlude the blood vessels, particularly if it is going to take you a little while to seek your veterinary attention. Fractures above the elbow and above the knee can be a little bit more difficult to splint uh, because you it's, it's hard to splint above the hip joint or the, or the shoulder joint. Uh, the main thing with that would be to try and keep your pet quiet and minimize their movement until you can get them somewhere to number one give them some pain relief um, super importantly and then determine the degree of the injury so we can work out what we need to do to to help them one of the other thing that's important is actually to recognize some of the signs of poisonings so different poisons will cause different things there are some poisons that will particularly affect the gastrointestinal tract. So you will get, so things like fertilizers in particular, um, you'll get gastrointestinal upset. You'll start with uh, vomiting and uh, diarrhea sometimes, uh, nausea as well. So all those kind of things can happen associated with that. And then you can have the the neurological toxins, uh, cannabis for one. So if a dog's got into someone's stash, then you might notice some neurological signs. We also see neurological signs in some fungal poisoning. So some mycotoxins where you will have some tremoring and staggering and seizuring is also very possible too. Other types of poisonings that we do have. So we have some uh, types of poisons that will cause bleeding disorders. So rat sack is a big one here. It actually affects the clotting cascade and will make dogs bleed out. Uh, that They could be bleeding externally, but also bleeding internally. And at times that is something that can be difficult to, to determine. And that's a poisoning that might not happen straight away. The dog might eat the rat sack and you think, oh, they're fine, nothing's happened. But then, you know, you can have bleeding that happens two, three, four days, but you know, two weeks after the fact, if things build up in their system. So it is important if you know there's rat sack that's missing to make sure that we got on top of it. The good thing with rat bait poisoning is we do have an antidote. Uh, so we can effectively treat that if that's the case. There are other types of toxins that cause kidney kidney damage and kidney failure. Like I mentioned before, we have um, the lily toxicity from, from household plants uh, or antifreeze can, can cause kidney failure. Then we also have some, some poisons that can cause liver failure. So you can see there's a whole lot of different things that can be going on. Most importantly, if anything looks like it's you know out of place, being disrupted, your dog's not acting right, whether it be vomiting, diarrhea, um, and having muscle tremors, then make sure that you get to your veterinarian and give them as much history or detail as possible. If there are boxes of things that have been disturbed and you're not sure, take photos um, of what they've been into because that information can be very helpful for us to work out the puzzle of what has been happening with your pet. Another thing that being winter in Melbourne in particular, I probably don't need to go into too much detail for, but in other areas, it is summertime, is heat stroke. Dogs can be really susceptible to heat stroke. The only way that they transpire or lose heat is through their, their tongue by panting and also through their paws. So they, can get hot very quickly and they can heat up a lot faster than we would expect them to. When you've particularly got a, a short nosed breed, what we call a brachycephalic breed, which is like your bulldogs, pugs, uh, boxers and, and French bulldogs, etc., when they're panting just to breathe sometimes, if they've got to pant more to because they're hot to try and lose some of that excessive heat and they have already narrowed airways, their body temperature can rise very, very quickly and they can go into a state of heat stroke and shock very, very quickly. So super important, never have animals in cars on hot days. And it doesn't even need to be particularly hot. If it's above 20 degrees, I wouldn't have my pet locked in a car for any time, any period of time. Um, and definitely not above 23 degrees, just the heat and if the sun is shining on those windows can cause some really nasty, nasty signs. 
heat stroke causes so the the symptoms that you'll see is heavy panting difficulty breathing excessive drooling the dog will look drowsy and seem uncoordinated there may be some vomiting there might be collapse then they start to seizure and go into organ failure dogs can die really quickly and it's really important to identify the, the signs so if it's above 20 degrees you've got one of these short breed, short nose breeds of dogs you've been out for a walk in the middle of the day and it's quite sunny you start to notice things that are abnormal try and get their body temperature down quickly the main things that i would be looking at in the early signs of heat stroke will be offer them a cool drink of water so if they're up and willing to drink water pop them in the shade make sure that there's something to cool them down so a cool cool and damp towel is good but you need to make sure that they don't go the other way and get too cold um, so you know, that's where having a thermometer and being able to monitor temperature is great the normal temperature for a dog sits between about 38 degrees celsius and 39 degrees celsius um, if i see a dog that's creeping up above sort of 39 to 39 5 40 then that for me are warning signs and you want to try and get that temperature down. Temperature doesn't come down, you need to seek attention. And in fact, if I had a, a bulldog or a pug that was showing these signs, I would be looking for veterinary attention straight away. They might need intravenous fluids. They may just need um, some other supportive care to help stop their body and their organs from shutting down. So that's a lot of information in different areas. And I think what I'm gonna do is go into more detail on each of those topics uh, in my next few few videos, just so we've got a little bit more information about toxic plants and what plants can cause what, uh, a little bit more information about you know household chemicals and things and and foods too. So there'll be more detail coming later on. If there's anything in particular that you want to know, please leave me a message and and ask. I'm more than happy to to discuss anything that you have on your mind. But First thing, familiarise yourself with emergency numbers. Make sure you've got a basic first aid kit so you've got something at hand if you need it because the time of an emergency is not when you want to be fumbling around searching for things. Understand what some poisons um, and what some common poisons can do and a couple other things that you can do to support your pets in the case of emergency. I hope you've enjoyed this video and I will see you soon.